This video is sponsored by Connell Guides. To get your hands on the most intelligent study guides on the market for GCSE and A-level English Literature, as well as GCSE and A-level History, visit connellguides.com and use code RS15 at checkout for 15% off your order. Juliet Capulet is arguably the most important character in Shakespeare's play Romeo and Juliet. But which quotations could we use if we wanted to analyse her? Let's find out. How's it going Revision Squad? It is me, Liam, aka Mr Knight, aka Dystopia Junkie, and in this video we are going to analyse how Juliet Capulet is presented in Shakespeare's classic play, Romeo and Juliet. To do that, we are going to think about who Juliet is, what her role in the play is, and what she might come to symbolise, represent, or be a metaphor for. After that, it is time to analyse some quotations. I will analyse 10 in total and even throw in some occasional contextual information as we go. Right at the end, I will even add in a big question for you to think about that will help you to consolidate your understanding of this central character. Hopefully everything I do here will help you out as you study or revise Shakespeare's play. If it does, please do let me know by giving this video a like, writing a comment on it, sharing it around with anyone else who might benefit from watching it, and of course, subscribing to my channel if you aren't already. YouTube tells me that almost three quarters of you who watch my videos aren't actually subscribed. So if that is you, please do click that lovely red subscribe button. It really does help me out massively. All right, now I've got all of that out of the way, just who is Juliet Capulet? So if we're going to talk about who Juliet is, we can consider her as a character, as someone with a role in a story, and as a symbol, metaphor, or representation for something else. As a character, Juliet is a member of the illustrious Capulet family, a high-status family in Verona. Vitally, Juliet is the only daughter of Lord and Lady Capulet, and so her relationship status is incredibly important to them. At the age of 13, it might seem strange to a modern audience that Juliet and marriage are mentioned in the same breath, but it is worth remembering that it was legal for women to marry as young as the age of 12 years old in Shakespeare's time, although not many people actually did tie the knot this young. Juliet's story role is pretty simple. Along with Romeo, she is the play's protagonist. Her relationship with him and all the obstacles thrown in its way helps to drive the plot forwards. Additionally, she matures over the course of the play, a process that is absolutely central to our understanding of it. But what can we say about Juliet's thinking a little bit more deeply? Well, we could say that she represents the tension between doing what you want to do and doing what society dictates that you should do. Much of the play's drama lies in Juliet's choice to marry Romeo, rather than marry the suitor her parents had chosen for her, a decision that comes down to her rebelling against tradition, her parents and society, and following her heart instead. Alright, hopefully that has given you a decent overview of who Juliet is, what her role in the play is, and what she might represent. But if you're going to write about Juliet, you are probably going to want to think about some quotations that relate to her. Aren't you? Well then, which quotations could we use to discuss Juliet? Our first quotation comes from Act 1, Scene 2. In discussing Juliet with Paris, Lord Capulet says, My child is yet a stranger in the world. She hath not seen the change of fourteen years. These lines of dialogue present Juliet in a couple of different ways. Firstly, if we were to situate these lines within the broader context of Act 1, Scene 2, we know that Lord Capulet is telling Paris that Juliet is too young to be married at the moment. By demonstrating this level of control over Juliet's life, 
a control that would have been typical for high-status Elizabethan fathers given that they were in charge of arranging their daughters' marriages, Lord Caplet shows that he treats Juliet as if she is his property. In other words, her father does not necessarily view her as a person in her own right. Secondly, these lines present Juliet as naive. The noun stranger suggests that Juliet has little to no worldly knowledge, implying not only that she is naive, but also perhaps that she requires protecting. Although this could suggest that Lord Capulet is protective of Juliet, it could also suggest that people do not take her very seriously because they think she does not understand how the world works. Both of these ideas are useful starting points for when it comes to considering how Juliet is presented in the play because as much as she is shown to be supposedly naive and is treated as her father's property, we definitely cannot say those things about her at the end of the play. Let's look at how Juliet is presented when she talks to her mother about marrying Paris early in the play. In this conversation, she says, I'll look to like if looking liking move, but no more deep will I indart mine eye than your consent gives strength to make it fly. Earlier in the scene, Lady Capulet has told Juliet that Paris will be attending the ball that night and suggests that Juliet should entertain his desire to marry her. When she asks what Juliet thinks about this, Juliet essentially says that she will try to fall in love with Paris if that's what her mother wants her to do. Ultimately, this presents Juliet as obedient, but how does the language create that impression? When Juliet says she will look to like, this means that she will try to fall in love with Paris or find things about him that make him attractive to her. However, she will only do this because it is what her mother tells her to do. This impression is created by the second half of the line, for looking can mean expecting in Shakespeare's time, and liking move can mean feelings of attraction develop. Therefore, Juliet says that she will try to become attracted to Paris if that is what her mother expects will happen. This suggests that Juliet is obedient because she is going to try to force herself to be attracted to Paris because it is what her parents expect. However, this impression is reinforced by the following two lines. When Juliet says she will indart her eye, the verb indart essentially means to throw. She will throw her gaze upon Paris and consider him as a prospective husband, but only as much as her mother consents or gives approval for her to do so. Overall then, these lines show that Juliet is really obedient at the start of the play. In this sense, she is the perfect Elizabethan daughter because she does not argue with her parents and respects their decisions when it comes to her love life. However, Juliet's naive and obedient presentation is dashed during the Capulet Ball. After she and Romeo share their sonnet and kiss at the end of it, Juliet states, Then have my lips the sin that they have took. Juliet's line of dialogue shows that she is beginning to lose her innocence and obedience now that she has met Romeo and true love has started to take a hold. When she states, then have my lips the sin that they have took, Juliet uses an imperative sentence to tell Romeo to reclaim the sin that her lips took from him, which is a flirty and somewhat metaphorical way of her telling him to kiss her again. Although Juliet is presented as a child who has not considered marriage earlier in the play, here we see that she has become much more mature already. She isn't just a curious teenager who's had a quick snog. By insisting that Romeo kisses her again, Juliet is presented as being romantically dominant, meaning that she is not the innocent, obedient little girl that she was first presented as. For Shakespeare's audience, such disobedience to her parents' wishes, they wanted her to fancy Paris after all, was likely to have been shocking and somewhat scandalous, which in turn makes the play much more entertaining. All right, we've had the Capulet ball scene, now let's jump to the balcony scene. This scene contains loads of useful quotations about Juliet, and I think it would be remiss of me to not mention it at least once in this video. So, when Juliet is reflecting on her newfound love for Romeo 
and the incompatibility of their romance because of their family's feud, she says. What's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other word would smell as sweet. Here, Juliet is presented as insightful because she highlights the pointlessness of the feud. When she asks, what's in a name? Juliet is referring to Romeo's surname and the fact that he is a Montague. When she asserts that a rose would smell just as sweet if it was called by any other word, she's explaining that names don't actually really matter. It's the people or objects that those names signify that are important instead. As such, Juliet expresses that she thinks it is pretty stupid that she and Romeo cannot be together because he is a Montague and she is a Capulet, because she doesn't love him for his name, but for who he is. This is quite a conceptually deep discussion for a 13 year old to engage with, and yet Juliet is doing it with ease. This is what makes her seem insightful and wise, because despite her tender years, Juliet knows that the feud continues because of something as silly as a pair of names. Furthermore, this impression is reinforced because her dialogue contains an instance of hypophora. But what's hypophora? Well, it is a rhetorical technique whereby someone asks a question only then to answer it immediately, thus short-circuiting their audience's thinking and making them more readily accept the answer given to them. Consequently, Juliet isn't just insightful because she can see how silly the feud is, but she seems insightful because she is a skilled rhetorician. Later in the balcony scene, Juliet is presented as pragmatic. This is revealed by her response to Romeo swearing to the moon as he vows that his love for her is genuine. Juliet's retort is, Oh, swear not by the moon, the inconstant moon. Juliet's interruption of Romeo and dismissal of his swearing to the moon shows that Juliet is pragmatic. By interrupting Romeo and dismissing his vow, we get the impression that Juliet is somewhat frustrated by Romeo's highly poeticised language, suggesting that she would rather speak in simple, straightforward and literal terms rather than in poetic hyperbole. Indeed, her dismissal of Romeo's vow is seen in how she describes the moon as inconstant. This adjective means changing, fluctuating, unstable. The moon has many phases, disappears and reappears, and is therefore not consistent or constant. By using this adjective then, Juliet highlights the foolishness of Romeo's poetic language. Because if he swears his love to the inconstant moon, what does that say about the permanence of his love for Juliet? Juliet's pragmatic or more literal approach to love suggests that she is more used to thinking about love in courtly rather than romantic terms. Courtly love was characterised by viewing relationships in terms of the political or financial gain that they trigger, rather than in the strong positive emotions that they might prompt. As such, Juliet's dismissal of Romeo's romantic language suggests that her understanding of love has been largely informed by courtly ideals which may be why meeting Romeo, a true romantic, has such a profound effect on her. Additionally, Juliet's dismissal of Romeo's words and the fact that she interrupts him might also suggest that she is the dominant partner within her relationship with Romeo. This dominance further reinforces our idea that Juliet's naivety and childlike innocence is on the decline after she has met the young Montague. Next up, let's consider how Juliet is presented after she finds out that Romeo has slain Tybalt, her cousin, in battle. After the nurse tells her this news, Juliet states, Beautiful tyrant, fiend angelical, dove-feathered raven, wolvish ravening lamb, despised substance of divinest show. Now, of course, the list of noun phrases that Juliet uses in these lines refer to Romeo. I would argue that they show Juliet to be conflicted between family loyalty, something that was incredibly important in Shakespeare's age and also in Renaissance Verona, and her love for her husband, an impression that is created by Juliet's use of oxymoron in these lines. Beautiful and tyrant aren't words that you would usually put together, and calling a fiend, kind of a sort of devil, angelical, is definitely contradictory. 
as is calling something divine despised. However, despite the conflicts that Juliet very obviously feels in these lines, I think they also hint that she is ultimately siding with Romeo. This is because her lines are somewhat poetic, given that they feature several instances of oxymoron. In speaking in a somewhat poetic way, Juliet's dialogue is beginning to adopt characteristics of Romeo's speech, therefore implying that she is devoted to him in spite of the conflict that she feels. Alright, now we're going to jump to Act 3, Scene 5, which is the scene in which Juliet's parents tell her she will soon be marrying Paris. In this scene, Lady Capulet also suggests that she is going to hire an assassin to murder Romeo in an act of revenge for killing Tybalt. Lady Capulet asserts that this will satisfy Juliet, to which she responds. Indeed, I never shall be satisfied with Romeo till I behold him. Dead is my poor heart, so for a kinsman vexed. These lines are great because they contain some very clever wordplay. This wordplay hinges around the word dead, which has been split from the rest of the dialogue by a pair of dashes. The specific effect of this is that Juliet's faltering delivery of her dialogue means that dead can be interpreted as either ending the sentence from the previous two lines, or it can be read as beginning a sentence that the following line completes. Bear with me here because I'm going to go through what the different versions of these lines mean and why they are important. So, Indeed, I never shall be satisfied with Romeo till I behold him, is pretty straightforward. Juliet is saying that she won't be happy until she sees Romeo again. This is Juliet telling her true feelings, but they are ultimately concealed by her wordplay so that she doesn't give things away to her mother. You can see the wordplay if you think dead should end. Indeed, I never shall be satisfied with Romeo till I behold him because this means she won't be happy until Romeo is killed. Now, Juliet doesn't actually believe this, but the wordplay allows her to trick her mother into thinking that she wants Tybalt's murderer slain. However, if dead begins a sentence that goes, dead is my poor heart, so for a kinsman vexed, we can interpret this line as Juliet feeling totally devastated. Her heart has died at the thought of Romeo being assassinated. Here, the kinsman she refers to is indeed her husband. But if you just read the line as being, is my poor heart so for a kinsman vexed? We get the impression that Juliet is upset because Tybalt, the kinsman in this interpretation, has been killed. She isn't totally devastated because her heart has not died, but she is still quite upset. This wordplay sees Juliet simultaneously speak the truth and trick her mother into thinking that she hates Romeo and is sad about Tybalt dying. Now this of course presents Juliet as being incredibly clever, as this is a piece of sophisticated wordplay. But I think it is more important for us to recognise that by trying to deceive her mother, and being successful at it apparently, Juliet makes it clear that she is distancing herself from her family and has ultimately chosen Romeo over them. Given that she starts to play as an obedient little girl, this is quite a significant change. The idea that Juliet has distanced herself from her family is reinforced later on in the same scene. After Lady Capulet tells Juliet that she will be marrying Paris, the young woman retorts with, I will not marry yet. Ultimately, this shows us that Juliet has rejected her family because she has dismissed their wedding arrangements for her. In this short quotation, the strong modal verb will has been modified by the negation not to show that Juliet has absolutely made her mind up on this matter. There is no hesitancy or doubt in her utterance whatsoever. Now this may have shocked an Elizabethan audience, given how important family loyalty was during Shakespeare's time. Furthermore, in rejecting her parents' wedding arrangements for her, Juliet really is going against societal norms as well, and so this element of Shakespeare's play could be considered somewhat subversive. A modern audience, though, might fully support Juliet here. Arranged marriages are much rarer these days, and allowing a woman to make her own mind up regarding who she does or does not marry 
is much more in line with today's greater degree of gender equality. However, it is not just her parents who Juliet rejects towards the end of the play. Let's have a look at what she says to the nurse in Act 4, Scene 3, only moments before drinking the potion that will enable her to fake her own death. Here, Juliet says, Gentle nurse, I pray thee leave me to myself tonight, for I have need of many horizons to move the heavens to smile upon my state, which, well thou knowest, is cross and full of sin. Juliet's dialogue, in short, is a lie. She tells the nurse that she needs to make many horizons, and now meaning prayers. Juliet says that she needs to pray because she will soon be sinning by marrying another man, despite already being married, and so she claims she wants the heavens and God to approve of her new marriage. Is this what Juliet is actually planning on doing though? No. Juliet is planning on drinking the potion so that she and Romeo can be reunited, and so these lines are a bunch of lies. This is important because it shows that Juliet has fully matured and become more or less independent. Throughout the play, the nurse is essentially a mother figure to Juliet, whereas she is also something of a leftover from Juliet's infancy, given that the nurse would have breastfed Juliet in her duties as a wet nurse. By lying to her then, Juliet creates the impression that she no longer requires mothering and is no longer a child. Now, I don't know about you, but I find this to be quite sad. The nurse is Juliet's closest ally throughout the play, and we get the impression that the nurse really does love Juliet. By lying to her, Juliet severs this connection, just so she can be with some chap she's only known for a short time. In a sense, you might even argue that Juliet's devotion for Romeo has therefore caused her to be quite narrow-minded or harsh. Either way, she is definitely shown to be independent in these lines because she lies to the nurse. Last of all, let's jump to the play's final scene. After waking up, noticing that Romeo has died and with the knowledge that guards are swiftly approaching, Juliet decides to commit suicide. This is seen by the lines. O oh, happy dagger, this is thy sheaf, there rust and let me die. Here we can see that Juliet is fully committed to Romeo, a commitment that has driven her to desperation. The act of suicide, killing herself so that she can be reunited with Romeo in afterlife, of course shows this, but the somewhat oxymoronic personification of the dagger in Happy Dagger also suggests this, because to associate a murder weapon with joy creates the impression that Juliet celebrates the fact that she will die. Furthermore, these lines imply that Juliet has matured. When she uses the word this, she is of course referring to her body, and by calling her body a sheaf, she makes it clear that the dagger will rest inside of her, rusting as she bleeds onto it. This act of penetration symbolises Juliet's maturity because it acts as a metaphor for sexual intercourse and the loss of virginity. This impression is reinforced by the fact that it isn't just anyone's dagger, but Romeo's, the weapon of course being a blatant phallic image, that kills Juliet. Interpreted in this way, you could argue that Juliet has literally been killed by her newfound maturity. Perhaps Shakespeare was trying to warn his audience of the perils of growing up too soon, or highlights the fact that love can be deadly, driving people to commit extreme acts. And on that bombshell, that is my analysis of 10 quotations relating to Juliet complete. Don't close the video yet though, as that means you'll miss today's big question. And that question is, which quotation best contrasts with, my child is yet a stranger in the world, and why? Now feel free to do whatever you fancy with that question. You could use it to form the basis of a flashcard or mind map. You could use it to prompt debate with friends and classmates if you are working together. Or you could even use it to prompt a short evaluative paragraph. And you know where would be a great place to write that paragraph? That's right, the comments section. 
It always brightens my day to see the lovely ideas that you lot come up with. And if you are feeling brave enough to share your ideas with me, I'll make sure to give it a reply and some quick feedback. So why not give it a go? And of that question still lingering in your mind, I guess it is time to wrap up this video. Genuinely, I really do hope that you have found this video to be helpful and that you feel a bit more confident when it comes to studying and revising Shakespeare's play. Of course, if this video has helped you out, please do let me know by giving it a like, writing a comment on it, sharing it with anyone who might benefit from watching it, and subscribing to my channel too, if you haven't already. Please do remember that, as always, I hope that you have an awesome rest of the day. If you are revising, please do take frequent short breaks, as a burned out student is not a happy or successful student, which is what I think you deserve to be. So if you are analysing Juliet, you might want to think about how she is presented as an innocent child at the beginning of the play. How this decreases as the play progresses and she becomes insightful or wise or dominant after she meets Romeo, her true love. And finally, you might want to think about how she is mature at the end of a play, where she rejects her family and ultimately kills herself.